Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Mary Kimball. I'm the Executive Director of U.S. Quidditch. Tonight, we are having a discussion on the documentary Brooms Up and the 10th anniversary of World Cup 4. World Cup 4 took place on this weekend, 10 years ago in New York City, featuring nearly 50 teams from around the country as well as Canada. And we are joined by a number of people who were um, there or formative in more of the early days of our sport. So I'm just gonna quickly go down the list of all the people we have joining us and then they will introduce themselves. Uh, so we have Alex Benepe, who's the co-founder of the sport. He is the former US Quidditch commissioner and he's a current board member with the International Quidditch Association. Um, we have Devin DeVoe, a player formerly with Chestnut Hill College. Becca, Dup Becca DuPont from Texas A&M also Lone Star Quidditch Club and a member of the U.S. national team. We have Phil Gordon, who was a player on Middlebury Quidditch. Dan Hansen, a player from Emerson College, Lost Boys, Crimson Elite. He's also a longtime referee and is a former USQ board member. We have Brittany Holzer from NYU. Max Kaplan, also from Chestnut Hill College, a former USQ board member as well and one of the organizers of World Cup 4. We have Allison Nev, formerly Allison Gillette, uh, a player with Boston, uh, Emerson College, excuse me, uh, also with the U.S. national team and was a longtime volunteer for different IQA and USQ events. We have Kenzie Teller of Boston University, QC Boston, Lone Star Quidditch Club, the U.S. national team, as well as the MLQ team, the Austin Outlaws. And lastly, we have Victor Tumambang from NYU. Um, so thank you everyone so much for joining us and panelists, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you got involved with the sport and everything like that? Anyone can start, but I will call on people if we want to. I'll jump in. Um, hi everybody, I'm Phil Gordon. Um, I got introduced to Quidditch at Middlebury. I got convinced to, I think it was the second World Cup, joined one of the Middlebury teams competing to compete against Vassar, which uh, was <laughs> surprising to me, a pretty big battle. Um, and yeah, just got hooked to the, the level of competition was, and just like the camaraderie was super fun. Um, and it was fun to like play a silly game <laughs> with, with fun and silly people. All right, well, I'll go next. Um, I'm Becca DuPont. I got started playing Quidditch um, at Texas A&M. Um, I found it at our, our school's uh, student organization fair and went to my first practice and saw all these ladies being super badass and knew that I wanted to be a part of it. And then I loved it so much, I kept playing for a while outside of college. Um, so this was a super uh, awesome tournament, and I'm, I'm glad to, to be reliving the memories with everyone. I have to follow Becca. Hi, Becca. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kedi Teller. Um, yeah, I joined Quidditch my sophomore year. I ran track at Boston University my first year and intended to do so for four years, but had a lot of problems with my coaches. Um, so when I quit, I wanted something else to do. I didn't know Quidditch was a thing until somebody invited me to go along to watch a practice. And um, I watched, I was obsessed with it and addicted to it. And next thing I knew I was doing it for what? It was like eight or nine years, it was way too long. So yeah, it was, uh, it's nice to reconnect with some old faces. Kedzie, I think that was me you were with because I was with two of my friends who were watching an Emerson game and we were on a picnic blanket and neither of us played Quidditch yet. No, that's no. So yes, you are who I, you're right. You're absolutely right. I was with you the first time I saw it. And then when I came back for fall semester, this girl on my floor was like, I'm going to go try out. And I was like, what are you doing? And I went and I watched. I was like, wait, no, I'm doing it too. So it was good times. Since I already jumped in, I'll go next. Um, I'm Dan Hansen. Um, I got into Quidditch because literally all my friends were doing it and I was the last one and they didn't even let me play because I didn't sign up in time. Um, and then I got into it too late in spring 2009 and then played for like, 
I don't know, eight years, I think I say. Um, and then as Mary read out my <laughs> long resume, uh, got involved in everything I possibly could. Was that all the things I was supposed to say? Yeah. I felt you got it. We'll go next. Uh, my name is Victor Smombing and I'm Brittany Holster. We're from the NYU Quidditch team and uh, we got into Quidditch because we both saw a flyer. Um, shout out to Sarah Landis and Lizzie Denning for starting it up for us. Um, and it was kind of history from there because um, we had a lot of like hardships kind of building our team since it was so brand new. We started that semester of World Cup four. So it was in November. We started playing just learning the rules and getting our equipment together in September, late September, you know? Um, so it was a, it was a, it was a journey those two months, but uh, I'm, I'm, you know, hopefully tell you guys a little bit more of that later. One we'll never forget. <laughs> I can go next. Um, and if I break up in the audio, somebody let me know, I can dial in on my phone, but hello, I am Allison Neves. Everybody here knows me as Allison Gillette or Allie G. Um, I got into Quidditch after transferring to Emerson my sophomore year. Um, I wanted a legit sport to be able to play and I felt like none of the Emerson actual teams were, were intense enough and I loved Harry Potter and found this amazing Quidditch team that was way more intense than any other sport at the college. It was also the biggest student group. We were like the football team at Emerson, which was, was pretty exciting. Um, so my first World Cup was in Middlebury in 2009. I'm also from Vermont, so I had read a bunch about uh, Alex and everybody starting Quidditch in my local newspaper when I was still in high school. Um, and then after playing at Emerson, I became the commissioner at Emerson. Uh, and after leaving Emerson, I played for USQ and I was the gameplay director when we were in Kissimmee uh, and then the hospitality director when we were in um, Myrtle Beach. Uh, and, and Quidditch is very near and dear to my heart because it's where I met all of my best friends in my life. Um, a lot, of, some of these people on this call right now were at my wedding. Um, as an example, some of them are still my best friends today. Um, and it also really helped me with my career. I think it's a really great thing to have on your resume, even now. I mean, I can't believe it's been 10 years. I feel really old, but even now it's the first thing in any job interview. Somebody asks me is what the heck is Quidditch? Tell me about that. So, uh, it's, re it's really helped me with my career and my friendships. And I wouldn't have traded this, uh, this experience for anything at all. And Alex wants me to show you guys a picture of my son. I actually just had my first child two months ago. He's 10 weeks old uh, as of yesterday, but this is him uh, wearing his, uh, <laughs> his future Quidditch star uh, uniform. So his name is Nash and he is going to be an amazing Quidditch player. And my stepdaughter Zoe is over there. She's a huge Harry Potter fan as well. She is actually 11. So she got her Hogwarts acceptance letter um, on her birthday this year, right? Yeah. Awesome. I'll go. Um, I am Devin DeVoe from Chestnut Hill College. Um, I got in on the ground floor, so to speak. Uh, Max Kaplan, a friend of mine, brought it to me and said, hey, would you be interested? And a lot like Allison, I, um, I wanted an outlet that was a little more intense than the you know Division three basketball team at the time. So, um, so you know the sport where I kind of got to toss people around, <laughs> which is the thing you could do at the time, seemed really appealing to me. It still does, really. But um, but uh, yeah, no. So I took to it, and uh, it was a, it was a really great experience. I love it, and a lot like and much like Allison said, um, when you it's really great to put on a resume, and because it's the first thing anyone notices. Um, actually, my one, my first like big boy job out of college, um, I mentioned that I played Quidditch and we spent, I don't know, 35 of the 45 minute interview talking about it. And the only reason I got hired, um, I, I came to know this, was because uh, they Googled me after I left the, the, the building and they found my, some clips of me playing Quidditch. And my boss's exact quote was, well, if he's not lying about this, then he seems like a good enough guy. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, Quidditch has, uh, is, oh, it does open doors or at least starts a conversation. It seems like it seems like a good time for me to go. Hi, everyone. I'm Max. I 
um, started Chestnut Hill College Quidditch. I was famously Dev's roommate while we were in school um, and, and living the Quidditch dream together. Um, I'm, I'm dialing in from my phone. I feel like the, the kooky uncle who couldn't figure out how to get Zoom to work on their computer. So, so apologies. Um, but I remember a friend of ours show, showed me a YouTube video of some kids at this little school in Vermont called Middlebury playing, playing Quidditch. And we had this running, I guess, running joke that, that our school looked a lot like Hogwarts. And so I think it went from, from being a joke to becoming very real um, when, when I said, why don't we pick, pick up some brooms from a supply closet and, and try this thing out. Um, and I remember Alex sent us, I think like a Word document with all the rules in it. Um, and, um, you know, and I think the rest is history. I think Chestnut Hill was probably one of the earlier schools to get in on the fun. And I remember we were, we were very committed early on. Our, our student activities team was super excited about it and invested in it, which really allowed us to participate, I think, um, in the way that we did. We um, went on to attend the World Cups um, and I was um, on the board um, in the beginning as well. Um, and I think I probably um, have my have my experience um, with the IQA um, to thank for my career in social media. Now I, I was the the social media director or the person um, yelling over yelling over the microphone at tournaments about you know making sure sure we were live tweeting the game. So um, yeah, so I I owe Quidditch a lot, and I'm excited that we can all reunite this evening. I think that was all of our panelists, right? Let me just check the list. Yes, awesome. Um, so audience members, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, to get us started though, Alex has some questions to kick off the discussion in a bunch of different directions. So Alex, you wanna take it from here? Yes, sir, thanks, Mary. Um, Devin had a, had a question for you first. I remember <clears throat> right before the event started, we got an invitation. I, I don't remember which studio it was, but some new studio wanted to do an in-person interview at their <clears throat> studio in Times Square. I believe you were the person, maybe with a teammate, who went there like the day before the tournament to appear at a new studio. And I just wanted to know what that experience was like going to Times Square to represent the whole sport. Um, in a word, bonkers. Uh, <laughs> um, it was myself, Max, and uh, a, a friend of ours, Kelly, um, who was also on the team. And I remember driving up in, I remember because we, we, we picked up a bunch of supplies um, and uh, we drove up in a U-Haul. And uh, <laughs> one of my funniest memories is, uh, I can't remember what bridge it is right now, but I just remember the U-Haul was way too big for it. And the side of the mirror just kept slapping against the side of the deal. And I was like, there's no way this should be happening. But uh, as far as the interview went, um, you know, I, uh, it was ESPN News, uh, which I don't think is a station that exists anymore. Um, and uh, it was a show that certainly doesn't exist anymore. And um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a surreal experience, you know. Uh, we're sitting in this booth and it was, um, and he was in, he was in uh, Connecticut uh, at the ESPN studios and he asked us a series of questions and, um, you know, it was fun. And I didn't, and, and I thought, because, you know, I, I, I watch a lot of sports and no one watches e ESPN news. So I thought no one would catch it. Um, and, um, and certainly no one would catch it at, you know, 5 p.m., you know, Eastern. And I remember walking in the next day and it was, it was like if Beyonce walked into a room like today, <laughs> it was like, it was like, they were like, oh my God, you, we saw you on TV last night. Oh my goodness. And I was signing autographs and it was, it was such a ridiculous, ridiculous experience. Um, you know, I, and, and moving like a few years after up until I want to say four years after that, I was still getting random Facebook messages from people who said, Hey, you're the guy who played Quidditch. I think I saw you on TV one time. Um, I just wanted to say, Hey, I really liked you. And I was like, wow, this is so weird to have fans. Um, but it really just solidified that, you know, Quidditch is a lot more than just a game. It, you know, people really get in, invested in it emotionally and, um, and, and, and from an entertainment standpoint. Uh, and uh, yeah, the whole thing, the whole experience is really um, surreal. And I, I didn't think it would have lasting power, but it did, believe it or not. <laughs> awesome, Deb, thanks. Uh, the next question is for Victor and Brittany. <clears throat> um, what was it like having you know, just started your brand new team and then have your home turf suddenly invaded by like 40 or 50 teams, many of whom are like super veteran and experienced. Um, 
well, like I, like I said earlier, it was, it was, um, it was a, a wild ride because uh, I forgot who mentioned it before, but they, they mentioned that they had such support from their student organizations and, and the administration, where as we ran into so many roadblocks, um, we couldn't get funding. We couldn't get, um, you know, permission to use, N to use NYU's name. Um, it had to be Quidditch at NYU as opposed to NYU Quidditch. Um, I dug out my old jersey. We spray painted our jersey in the middle of Washington Square Park. We got in trouble for using the torch logo. Uh, yeah, it was it was a disaster. It was rough, to be honest. Um, uh, but again, it's something that we really owe everything to. We, we wouldn't have met each other, been together. Um, and as far as it being on home soil, uh, I'm originally from New York. Uh, so it was, it was really pretty cool. You know, uh, those two months of training and, and learning the rules and getting the whole team together was, was really, uh, was really awesome and, and scary as, as I'm sure it was for a lot of the teams, uh, coming to Clinton do it. And, and, um, it was our first major competition against, you know, um, other teams. So, uh, it was a, it was an amazing experience. Um, and you know, I, I just hearing everyone's story and thinking about it again is, is you know, bring back really good memories. Yeah. I don't know if we initially thought that we'd be talking about it 10 years later and here we are Definitely. Uh, <laughs> and we still remember it very fondly, but one moment I'll never forget is, um, so NYU, we're not really a sports school, obviously. Uh, so not a lot of people come to sporting events and typically they have to pay or bribe people to come to our basketball games or soccer games with free food and t-shirts. So we put out a bunch of flyers in the dorms and through word of mouth, we actually got a huge student cheering section. For, it was our night game. Yes. Night game, which I wasn't there for. Uh, uh, night game, day one. Yeah. And we had a huge cheering section, or, you know, I, I saw and I was told. Uh, um, someone said it was actually more than the amount of students that would typically show up to a basketball game. And they had made signs and they were screaming for us. And we had won one game and lost one game that day. And I remember the feeling on the field was electric. Like everyone was there to watch and play Quidditch. And we were just a part of it. And luckily we won and made it on to day two because of it. I, I remember uh, my, my memory of that day one of uh, uh, World Cup four was, it was our first game. I believe it was against Emerson. First, so it was our first official game as a team. We're all ready. We're all scared and nervous. <laughs> and we get the brooms up. And Sam, one of our chasers, sprints down to the middle, grabs Quaffle first, jets the other hoops, and scores. We go ballistic. Like, oh, my God, we scored 10 points. We're actually going to do it. It was the only 10 points we scored against Emerson. <laughs> <laughs> I think we lost, like, 150 to 10 or something like that. Yeah. But – it was definitely a learning experience, uh, something I'll never forget, and uh, um, just just uh, amazing all around. So. Yeah, thinking about our team back then uh, compared to the team that it is now, like we were definitely struggling, and now knowing that our team oh, yeah. was number one ranked. Yeah, we won year. regionals last year. Yeah. Uh, um, they get like $30,000 of, of funding from the school. I'm like, or was that when we were there? When but we, needed it, but. <laughs> we, we were we're happy to say that we were a part of it. Our names are uh, officially on the charter uh, at NYU as founders uh, uh, of the Quidditch team. So um, we're really proud of what we did. Um, wouldn't you know take anything back, and and uh, um, you know we wouldn't have the friends we have today w without it. So yeah, and being in New York, that first World Cup made it all the more special too. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, speaking of Emerson, that's a good transition to Allison. Um, you want to talk to us just, I mean, you've played Quidditch for so long on so many teams. You want to talk about <clears throat> your experience in Quidditch, maybe um, experiences from the event, particularly the upset against Tufts. Uh, and also we have a question in the chat here from, uh, from Jess Chen. She wants to know how many broomsticks have you broken in your Quidditch career? So maybe uh, if you can think of that, try to include in the answer. Yeah, sweet. Uh, broomsticks I've broken, 
I probably have never broken a broomstick, surprisingly. Um, I've, I've popped a bunch of bludgers and I've had one of my own broomsticks stolen from me that I had spray painted gold. Um, but that's it on the broomstick front. Uh, so, so yeah, so Emerson, I mean, so we're talking about, we're talking about early, early Quidditch here. So Middlebury, the, the very first year, Emerson wasn't there, but the second year Emerson was there. And then, you know, I started playing in the third year and then this was the fourth year was this World Cup in, in New York. So I like to think of us and a couple of other teams like like a and and Middlebury, the original brutal teams. We were we were brutal. We treated this like a real sport from the beginning. We we were I mean, we all loved Harry Potter, but it wasn't about Harry Potter for us. It was about winning. It was about being the most athletic out there. It was about coming up with new ways to do things. Um, I mean, we had a coach one of I mean, we were the first team, I think, to ever have a coach. And we literally made plays on whiteboards. I think it was harder to get on the Quidditch. There were tryouts um, way back in 2009. There was tryouts. I mean, maybe even 2008 there were tryouts. I'm not sure, but it was really hard to make it onto this team. Um, and what what we found, and again, same as NYU, we Emerson's an art school. I mean, nobody there was supposed to be a super athlete. So really, what you had was all of these people who wanted a degree in the arts that had been really great athletes in their high schools, some of them, um, that went and played played this sport. So we really quickly became the football team at Emerson. Um, we, we had a house league um, from the very beginning. That meant that there was a travel team that you had to try out for and this was this was as early as 2009 um, there's a travel team you had to try out for and that was the team that all of you guys have played before but then we had house teams um, that played each other intramurally and when I was commissioner I think Kedzie the first year that we did the sort of all Boston thing was our senior year so that would have been 2011 2012 um, where the house team started playing other Boston house teams um, and it's just really crazy to see where the sport is today. So, you know, we we went from, I remember our first year, I'm actually wearing, sorry, I'm wearing the, the jerseys, our original jerseys. These were actually from the soccer team at Emerson. They didn't want them anymore and they were gonna throw them away. So we took these jerseys um, and we wore them and we actually had someone in the, and again, Emerson was a film school. So we had someone in the costume department that uh, actually sewed capes for us they were like professional capes they were leather holsters and they were clipped on with metal clips in the back and i think new york was the first year we didn't wear the capes anymore um so that was that was really huge seeing that transition i think i think new york was the first year that it was evident that quidditch was going to become a real sport um before then it really was more people that really loved harry potter and we're fans of, of the books and things like that. And I think New York was the first stepping stone to it becoming this, this huge sport. And it was really cool for me knowing I was gonna be on this panel to go back and take a look at, I, I mean, I didn't even know if Emerson still had a team or anything like that. And I did some homework before this call. And I think a, a testament to success is when you've built something and you can leave it uh, and it still runs phenomenally. And Everyone that I see on this call are some of the, the founders of making this sport exactly what it is. And I don't think hardly any of us are really super involved anymore at all. And it's thriving. It's thriving at Emerson. It's thriving across the country. It's thriving across the world. And to me, that that is, I'm just so proud of everybody that has gone on and, and done all this stuff um, without us. Um, what Some of the things that stick in my mind at, at that New York Cup was, um, I remember my one of my best friends, Erin, broke her rib at that tournament. That stunk. I remember us going in and being like, this is the year we're going to beat Middlebury because we had always been in the top three at World Cups and we had our big Tufts upset um, in the quarterfinals. And it was interesting because nobody ever talked about Tufts. Um, nobody ever worried about Tufts. Um, our coach had made plays and talked about specific players from other teams that we were ready to face. And all of a sudden this team this dark horse that nobody had ever heard of comes and uh, ends up upsetting us in the quarterfinals. It was, it was really hard for us. I think almost everyone on the team cried. Um, I think some people were really bitter, um, but overall it, it, it was a really great experience. And uh, the World Cups after that just got bigger and better. Um, and I, I think today it's, it's much more so, so a sport than, um, than a Harry Potter fan club, which is, which is cool for me to see. 
Um, and I know Dan's all, <clears throat> also on here, so I'm sure he'll say a few other things as well. But did I cover all the things you asked me, Alex? You asked me a bunch of stuff. You got it, Allison. Thank you. <laughs> um, and that's a good transition to Dan. So Dan, if you want to chip in more on the Emerson front, uh, but I was also really curious for you, Dan, since you were so heavily involved in really developing and evolving officiating and rules in the sport, if you want to talk um, not just about Emerson, but also about like what was the refing and rules like at that time and then how did it change over time, which is a really broad topic. So try to be succinct. <laughs> Well, on the on the Emerson front, uh, you can catch like a split second in the Brooms Up documentary of me furiously arguing with the referees about the tough score, which I maintain a goal of ours was not counted that should have been to this day. Um, with, but that was the very beginning of my extremely long eight year career of arguing with referees all the time, um, which helps me in my, mar in my marriage as well. Um, <laughs> But on the, speaking of refereeing, on the refereeing front, um, I vividly remember walking into the first game I saw at World Cup and Chris Beasley featured here in my virtual background, um, throwing his yellow hat, which was the flags, because this was like the first year that there were rules with, well, no, I think there was always yellow wand, red wand rules as like your yellow cards and red cards. Um, but that, it was more of like kind of just a thing with no basis before this New York World Cup four. Um, and then Chris like led the legitimacy of Quidditch refereeing um, by like just being totally prepared and like making calls based on rules in the rule book. Um, and I remember being like stunned by that right away. Um, but uh, Chris was, was kind of like a one man referee army. So once Emerson was done for the day, both days, like all of our players, Joanne Lamb, who I see in the chat, who I'm reuniting with after years and years. Um, I remember running around refereeing that day. Um, but all of us, since we had the house league and had like the most experience just from playing all these games, just ended up getting thrown on all the ref crews, um, which, you know, that's my style of Quidditch tournament. I love it, but it's, it's pretty crazy to think about, especially as refing develops in the future years. But World Cup four, it was a huge step forward when, like, I think, um, I'm not sure if Phil Palmer is here. Um, Phil Gordon, I don't know if you did any refing in Middlebury, but people were basically there just like as neighborhood watch to, to just make sure the rules were barely followed. And World Cup four was our first attempt at rules. I remember driving into New York City the night before the tournament. And um, we had like the big captains meeting, um, with, with everybody there and Will Hack, I think was probably running that, just kind of basically teaching everyone the rules the night before, because this was still before the era where like captains really taught their teams all the rules, I think. I don't know, people might disagree with me on that, but I don't think we really cared much about the rules. So uh, we, we basically just tried to get by and I feel like I remember going pretty well. In the documentary, Alex, you talk about not wanting injuries to happen and there were a few but I don't remember it being like the dominating storyline or like a horrible part of it or anything and um and then I ended up re head refereeing the final and <laughs> I watched a video of this years later for some reason um I like made a yellow card call against Tufts that like called off a goal for them when it was like 10 to 10 and like I in the video you can see that it's like the lightest push of all time so probably doesn't speak well to where refing was at at that time. And maybe I made a bad call that cost Tufts the whole game. I'm sure people would argue maybe my, my biased revenge. No, I'm kidding. I don't, I don't think I was biased, but who knows? We were all freaking like kids running around with all these crazy high intensity emotional situations. And it's crazy how much we made it work. That's a great summary, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, my next question is uh, for Max. Um, Max is a founding board member and uh, at that time board members were basically just all purpose volunteers doing everything. Um, what was it like behind the scenes of uh, planning for and executing World Cup for? Yeah, I love this question. I think the phrase that, that comes to mind is uh, building the plane as you fly it. You know, I think um, with Quidditch, we were we were building something very quickly that had um, so many logistical challenges, and I think the way um, 
people were able to organize from across the country and make something happen, especially before technology was even what it is now, you know. I think it's so remarkable looking back at how people were able to, to come together and, and create that moment. And I think from where I was sitting, you know, I was in Philly, so I was pretty close to New York, but I didn't know New York City as well as I, I do now. Now I've lived here for, for nine years, but um, I remember getting to New York and just thinking, like this, you know, we're not at Middlebury anymore. We're not at my school anymore. We're not on campus anymore. We are in the middle of of a of a huge city. So it, it I think that the scale of it um, really really settled in as as soon as we got there. Um, and I I think um, there were a lot of um, things looking back that I can't believe we pulled off. I think I think the news coverage, which Alex, I know you really orchestrated. Um, was was incredible. I mean, we had we had you know morning morning news shows there, evening news was covering it, newspapers were covering it, magazines were covering it, and I just remember that paired with the number of people, paired with I think um, just the the um, pulse of a live event. You know, your adrenaline was just through the roof, um, and so I look back on it and and it's like. I, I'm so impressed with what everyone was able to pull off because I think even pulling off an event like that now when, when the organization is much more mature and um, you know everything is much more established would still be really challenging. So, so I, think, um, I think we were all wearing many hats um, at the time and, um, and you know, the ones I was wearing I, were, were um, I think social media, um, I was working on our social media channels. I was a board member. I was um, leading Chestnut Hill's team um, and helping us, you know, make sure we could get up to New York. Um, I was, you know, co-pilot of the U-Haul full of brooms and hoops, you know. So I, I think, um, to be honest, it's a miracle that I graduated from college um, with anything above a 2.0 GPA. Um, and I think that's probably probably my closing remark that <laughs> because I, I don't know how that happened given how many things we were doing it at one time. Awesome. I think building the plane as you fly it is a great, great description. Um, but I'm also learning more as I go off into other things in my life that that's like a fairly common thread anytime you're building something new. Um, a friend of mine, a, a guy named Chromo once said something to me. I don't know if he made up this quote himself, but it really sticks with me. Um, the only difference between a big company and a small company is the number of doors in between you and the room full of people who are freaking out, <laughs> uh, which I think is uh, on point. Um, okay, next question I have here is for Becca. Um, so Texas A&M was one of the first Southwest teams to make major trips across the country. You guys had attended the previous World Cup number three where your team had attended in uh in Middlebury, Vermont. Um, what was it like going from World Cup three in Middlebury to uh, World Cup four in New York City? And what was your team's experience like? And how did the, the event and your team's performance live up to expectations or not? Um, so World Cup four was my second ever Quidditch tournament. Um, I played one tournament like the month before in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. So going from that to, you know, a World Cup in, in New York City was pretty insane. Um, I don't know if the, the hashtag my World Cup journey existed that time. Um, I, I probably wasn't on Twitter back then, but I mean, it was, you know, a couple of months in, into college and I was flying across the country with, with like 15, 20 people that I had just met, um, you know, we're all staying in each other's parents' houses the night before we fly out of Houston and then staying at this super sketchy hostel in New York City. Um, but it was such an incredible time. Um, like, I think we spent more time in that sketchy hostel than we did like even exploring New York outside of the tournament. Um, but it, I mean, it was like beyond my expectations. Uh, it really felt like this, I don't know, this crazy festival, like exactly like I guess I would have imagined a World Cup was like, like in the Harry Potter books. Um, and just having everyone kind of all the teams on top of each other, um, 
because you know we were confined in that in that small little park. Um, I think really contributed a lot to the to the magic of the event and you know how how I fondly look on on that tournament. Even though um, looking back, I I wish we had gone farther. But for my second ever tournament, I was pretty happy with how AM did. We we lost a close match to Emerson, which I am still slightly bitter about to this day. Um, but it was it was so much fun and you know going to that tournament so soon after I started playing like it really cemented for me that it was something that I loved and, and wanted to continue. Awesome thanks Becca. Um, next up we have Phil who is playing on Middlebury College the Middlebury College Quidditch team at that tournament. Um, this was the first time Middlebury had to defend their title away from home turf and I was just curious what that was like from you. And, and I also am aware that Middlebury had a big like fan group that came down to support the team in New York. Um, I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, I just want to say uh, thanks Alice for, for reaching out and having me. And honestly, like I hadn't thought about Quidditch in so long, but it was just like such an amazing experience for me. I'm glad I didn't have a, <laughs> like a stick up my butt and decided to try it out uh, when I got asked. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of getting down, I think Max said something like it really hit me when we got to New York City and like, I just realized like, I was like, wow, this is <laughs> like actually legit. Seeing all of the teams, realizing how big I had gotten, um, it like, it was really a major turning point and realized like how like serious it was so I, I think there was definitely a little bit of pressure like because we knew everybody was coming for us um, we knew that the competition was going to be stiff um, and that it wasn't going to be a cakewalk and and um, and it's a tournament like anything can happen so so yeah that was that was uh, a, a, it was awesome um, but I think the uh, the amount of support that we got from Middlebury in terms of how many people came down was, it was <laughs> unreal. Like it felt like we were back on campus at some points um, and definitely helped us. Like I definitely got, someone said like a surge of adrenaline, like every time we stepped on that pitch, like it was um, so much support um, and, and knowing that we had to <laughs> go out and be our holders, like I definitely, like we all knew that after like it was like our last time for Middlebury to like kind of be at the forefront and after that it was it was gonna be gone so yeah yeah I think uh, if, I, if I recall correctly I think either the college or the, or the or the club's budget like paid for a bus to bus fans down from Middlebury which is crazy I think Chestnut Hill did that too right Max didn't didn't your like mascot come one year. Yeah, our mascot came, um, and I don't think a lot of people even realized it was a school mascot because they thought it was just part of like the Harry Potter universe that was at the event. Because your mascot is a Griffin. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Uh, last but not least, the last question of the night is for, uh, and then we, we do have a couple of questions in the chat, but um, Kedzie, so you were abroad, I think, for this cup in particular, but you were playing before that and obviously played for a long time afterwards. Um, what are your main memories of, of the sport at this time? And like, yeah. what, what do you think are the most important ways that, that, that the playing experience and tournament experience evolved over time since then? Well, Allison, thank you for that lovely photo you just held up to your screen. Not one of my finer moments. Um, yep, great, good times. I was cornered. Back then, okay, so that's one of my finest moments, not that one. But my, the memories, honestly, like Dan, you hit on it, is just the evolution of the rule book was incredible. Um, like I, my very first tournament was World Cup three at Middlebury. And I remember getting there, it was freezing and wet. It was disgusting. I didn't know what I was getting into. I had never played anybody but kids at BU. And in the first game, they're like, listen, like you're physical, use your physicality. They're not going to call anything. There's like no rules. And I remember somebody being on a breakaway going to the goals because like the whole play had happened on our offensive end. And I remember this guy who had a breakaway. And I remember sprinting after him and literally with the broom between my legs, getting close enough to him to do a slide tackle from behind to trip him. 
And then, you know, tackled him and got the ball. And it was all totally legal, um, you know, so it was great. Um, so the game has definitely evolved for good reasons because that kind of play, not the best, um, but it was fun. And, you know, someone else used the word electric and that's how I felt about every single time I was on a pitch with people watching. Like people that came to watch Quidditch, like I've been an athlete my whole life and I've been in stadiums and on courts and on fields with, you know, people watching and there's something different about the way people rally behind Quidditch and it's just extra special. So love it. Um, yeah, I think my, you know, one of the biggest things I took away from those early years was just, again, the camaraderie. Um, just again, this idea, I, whenever people would interview me or ask me about the sport and they say, like, why do you play? I would always just say, um, the, the thing that stands out the most is that mix of worlds. And I think they talk about that in the documentary, right? There are people that were, who would never touch a ball of like an athletic, you know, an athletic situation at any time in their life. And then there were people who had never read a Harry Potter book. Um, and people who still to this day, I'm extremely good friends with that I may have never met otherwise. Um, so I think that was what was truly special. And like, I'll honestly I'll never, ever forget my last game with BU. And mind you, for those of you who don't know me, like I played for forever after I graduated, like BU was just the beginning. But, um, you know, I, we, it was Allison when we organized the, that Cannons tournament in Boston with a, it was like an invitational, we played on those, those like lacrosse fields and we lost to Villanova on a snitch grab, which was quintessential BU Quidditch. We could ball with the best of them in chasing, but couldn't catch a snitch. Um, great times. Um, and you know, the, you know, it happened, I watched it happen and I stood there and I didn't expect anything to happen other than, you know, the whistle with the blow and the entire BU Quidditch team came off the bench and from the field and all just like wrapped around, around me. And I get emotional thinking about it because like, I don't know, like, yeah, that was 10 years ago or whatever it was, which is ridiculous to say, I'm so old. Um, but that's a type of community that you just like, you know, that's a moment not a lot of people get. Um, and so like, yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing I take away is just the community, which I mean, guys, look at us sitting here. Like we all haven't seen each other in a billion years and like the flood of nostalgia is ridiculous. So I think that speaks for itself. <laughs> All right, uh, we have a we had a question in the chat uh, from someone named Ginny Weasley. Uh, they want to know what's the first step for youth to get involved in the sport. And I don't I don't really know what youth is defined as, but if anyone wants to hop on that question, you can go for it. I'll jump in. Um, I, I Max, do you remember when when we went to Chicago for Comic Con? Um, yeah, and, um, I sure do. Yeah, and you know we had some. I, I guess you can qualify this as youth. No, you couldn't. They were like eight or nine year old kids, right? Um, and um, and they just wanted to know, they were curious about uh, the dynamics of running with a broom or, or some sort of apparatus. And they were, uh, and they were curious, really curious ab about the rules. Um, the running and the throwing and the getting hit thing is kind of easy for them to conceptualize. Um, but really it's about just from my experience and sort of in teaching these kids, uh, the Chicago youth, the game of Quidditch. Um, it was really, it was really just about uh, you know getting them familiar with the rules and uh, letting them know it's okay to have fun and uh, you're going to look ridiculous at times and that's kind of the point and that's quite all right. Um, get comfortable looking ridiculous and have some fun with it. Yeah, and I think that if you are, if the person who asked this question is asking because they want to like try to play Quidditch or get a group together to play Quidditch, I suggest um, go to the U.S. Quidditch website. Uh, usquidditch.org and look for a team near you and try contacting that team because chances are they would be happy to run some kind of session with you or your friends or your group and, and set up some kind of youth match to teach you the sport. Um, Allison had a really good suggestion. Um, she, was, she was curious, um, or actually wait, before we get into that, we have a question from Joanne. Uh, she said, for someone who hasn't really caught up with Quidditch rankings in a long time, which teams are the strongholds these days? And I have no idea. So I'm hopeful someone here who's more connected, maybe Dan or Kedzie can, can help out. Or... Find someone gone. <laughs> I say, I, guys, for full disclosure, why this is so fun for me, I have not talked about Quidditch with anybody that's not a Quidditch player 
So like, and I don't have any of those people around anymore. And since I moved to Philadelphia and I moved to Philadelphia in 2017. So oh, wow, like this is all just a wave of flashbacks right now. <laughs> So with the college and like community team split, like you have to keep track of, of both levels. But once that happened, I fell off of, of uh, seeing which college team are at the top. I assume, I'm gonna assume it's still up there. Yeah, I would, I would say if you're curious, go to, go to 8th Man, uh, I think is your URL, 8thman.com. Uh, they have rankings and lots of opinions on who the best Quidditch teams are. Wait, can I ask um, a question really quickly? Who runs the eighth man? Is it still like, sorry, I like that. I love that that's still going on. Is that still? Oh, it's, like, it's going, it's going strong. They're like, uh, yeah. so Ethan Warren is the new editor in chief. Okay. Um, and there's so much other Quidditch media going on right now. Um, there's a brand new news outlet called fast break news. That's, um, formed by people who have, um, are either still in the college game or recently graduated. Um, and they're putting out content right now on player spotlights and teams to watch and everything. Um, and there's a bajillion podcasts. So eighth man has three different podcasts. Fast break has a couple. Um, and there's a lot others as well. Um, home from home. Um, oh my gosh, I'm going to blank on all of them. Um, I, uh, I, uh, oh my God. I am, I can't remember all their names. There are so many Quidditch podcasts right now. Um, so if you want to check them out, um, send us an email at info at usquidditch.org and we will hook you up with the list. There's a, there's a spreadsheet out there that has all of them and most of them are available on Spotify. So if you search for, um, Quidditch podcasts on Spotify, then you'll find a whole treasure trove. Oh my God, I'm gonna fall back into this, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Kenzie knows what he's doing the rest of his night. No! Um, <laughs> uh, or maybe the rest of the week. Um, okay. Um, Allison had a really good uh, question. She wanted all the panelists to go around and say, uh, like, what you're doing in your life right now. <laughs> Kenzie, you're on the screen. Why don't you go first? Oh, see, I have a tile view, so I didn't know that. Oops. Um, I don't know if you guys are seeing me. What you not? Um, yeah, so actually, when I moved to Philadelphia, I was working for the Women's Tennis Association. I was a creative director for videos with all of the top players in the world, which was awesome. Um, but now, then I broke off and started my own marketing consulting business. So these days, um, I consult with everything from individuals to large corporations on marketing and lots of social strategy, um, a lot of creative campaign development. Um, right now, I'm working with um, Amanda Freitag from the Food Network. I'm working with a robotics farm in California, and I work in uh, actually tourism here in Philadelphia. Awesome. Uh, Devin, what's your, uh, what's your post Quidditch life like? Um, well, uh, I, I mentioned... Uh, at Quidditch got me my first big boy job, and that was uh, that was in marketing. Um, that has progressed um, to now I am a strategic partnerships manager for an OTC company. Um, so we have products, everything from probiotics to women's healthcare products to a, uh, a, a, an antiperspirant. And my job is strategic partnerships, trying to figure out how we can reach people, consumers, HCPs, all that good stuff. Um, Oddly enough, I still do tend to bring up Quidditch now, nowadays. Uh, nowadays, it seems so wild, um, but uh, it, it, it'll come up, you know, because if, if someone brings up Harry Potter, it's a good talking point. Um, and I can say that in my career, I have certainly closed deals because I was a Quidditch player. Um, not ashamed to admit that. <laughs> I will hawk that out anytime I can. Uh, but yeah, that's what I'm doing now. I'm also in Philadelphia, so Kezi, we should probably get a team started here. Um, <laughs> or if not that, you can't just casually drop that. What part of Philly do you live in? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so I'm 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 in the Valley Kinwood section. Okay, sweet. I just moved from Rittenhouse to Northern Liberties. We'll talk. This is gonna. Yes, happen. we'll definitely talk. Team's okay. not gonna happen, but I'm gonna connect with you. So there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, and I can honestly say, and this isn't just because I'm on this panel, but Quidditch certainly has followed me in some way or another um, throughout the course of my career, either by happenstance, good talking point. Um, you know, an uh, icebreaker, anything like that. So it, it's always with me. I just got to get these knees right so I can start playing again. 
<laughs> awesome. Becca, what about you? So I stopped playing, I guess, I guess it was two years ago. Time flies. I can't quite remember anymore. Um, but I work for my environmental agency and I manage our wide program for contracting out um, water quality monitoring um, across the state. Um, and then now I've, I've picked up rec softball because I can't have no sports in my life. Um, or at least I guess I was before COVID hit and now, now I just sit in my apartment all day, every day. Um, but yeah, all of my, all of my friends these days are, are still some of the people that I, that I met from Quidditch, but they're all moving away slowly, but surely. So I feel like I'm going to have to join a team again soon. Cause I don't know how to make friends any other way. Yeah. Kid, you're one of those moving away. Awesome. Thanks, Becca. Phil, what about you? Yeah, so uh, I retired from Quidditch after <laughs> World Cup 4, I think. So uh, I'm still undefeated, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, uh, I'm, I live in the Boston area, like just outside of Boston um, in Watertown. And I work for a uh, nonprofit based in my hometown of Woburn, which is a suburb of Boston as well. And we uh, focus on youth development and uh, community building through civic engagement initiatives. So we have a AmeriCorps program that I run that uh, kind of has a lot of partners in the Boston area and in Boston. Um, and then, yeah, we've done a lot. <laughs> COVID has been pretty crazy for us. We've done a lot in terms of COVID response in our local community, which has been super busy, but also really awesome to kind of be able to have an impact and um, help out um, the community that I grew up in is a lot more diverse uh, in terms of demographics than when I was growing up. So it was really cool to be able to have that impact and see how we can continue to do that, um, especially <laughs> how hard the youth are having it now, not kind of being able to connect with each other. So um, it's a busy time for me, but it's really exciting. It's cool to <laughs> kind of connect and uh, the flashbacks were, were awesome uh, for me and yeah, really thinking about the camaraderie and definitely like, I don't know, like for me, this was one of the, probably one of the best Friday nights I'm going to have in a while. So. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Dan, what's going on in your life? Um, well, I got married uh, like a month ago. Um, so that's the big thing. I just bought a house. Oh, no, I've got a lot going on. Bought a house in West Jordan, Utah. Um, Phil, I'm from Reading, so which is the town next to Woburn, and uh, I've now ended up in Salt in Salt Lake City suburbs um, through random turns of very Quidditch influenced aspects of life, um, and so yeah, just uh, who knows what's next? I love Quidditch so much, and it's such a valuable part of my life, truly my glory days, and I think about it all the time, and so happy to have all these people in my life still. Awesome, Dan, thank you. Uh, Max, what about you, man? Yeah, um, Dan, if you run into any of the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, let me know. I watched the premiere this week and it was, <laughs> I have one. It was phenomenal. <laughs> um, yeah, since Quidditch, I, I mentioned that I was um, working on social media for, for the IQA at the time and I, I somehow parlayed that into an actual career in, in social media. Um, I started out as a social media coordinator um, at, at a small agency and um, with some twists and turns in my career, um, I ended up at Google. Um, and um, so now I lead social media marketing for Google Maps. Um, so um, I look after our own social media channels on at Google Maps, um, paid social media, um, influencer and celebrity marketing for the brand. It's a ton of fun. Um, I'm incredibly directionally challenged. So it's a miracle I even got to the World Cup in New York. So it, it feels right that I can maybe help some other people get from point A to point B successfully. Um, but yeah, I actually, um, I moved to New York um, 
in January of 2012. I graduated in 2011. Alicia kindly took me in to her studio at the time, and we ended up being roommates for my first year in New York. Um, and then um, now I'm living in Brooklyn with my with my um, fiance Brendan. We got engaged um, in September, so um, it's it's um, you know it's it, it feels good to have some some good news and some fun stuff going on amidst the the craziness in the world. Um, hi, Alicia, just saw you pop up in the in the chat. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm having as good of a time as I can be given given, um, you know, given everything going on. Um, and it's great to see everyone. I think I think we we can probably all agree that like these were such fundamental um, parts of our lives and, and you know, of our of our formative years, really. And for many of you, um, it still is. And um, so yeah, really, really excited to see all of these faces and names and watch watch the documentary, which has aged really well. Like the editing, the music, all of it, all of it looks so good. So I'm excited to take that trip down memory lane. Amazing, thanks, Max. Uh, Victor and Brittany, I think you guys, uh, you have a lot to share. <laughs> just yeah, uh, an epic uh, journey. Sorry about that. Uh, our we just got a golden retriever puppy, which we I'll put him on screen. You need to see him. Uh, you can kind yeah, of hold see on. Him. Yeah, I guess we're gonna have to show him now. Yeah, there. <laughs> He is trying to be good. Waiting for his food. Waiting for his treats. Um, but we, as far as Quidditch goes, we have both retired. Uh, jerseys in the rafters for sure. Uh, <laughs> since since graduation, um, and uh, I myself have started a small business, um, obtaining, selling all the latest sneakers and streetwear that you've probably seen on Instagram and stuff. So uh, it was been my passion. And my hobby for a very long time and i decided to you know take the next step and you know uh, start a business out of it so that's been going great um shout out to the the last dance documentary shooting all the jordans uh, uh way up so uh and, and Brittany. uh speaking of passions so i followed my passion about comic books and uh, i work as an editor at dc comics and uh quidditch was definitely a big conversation starter when i joined sure. the company for sure Amazing, thanks. Yeah, Brittany still gives me a of comics all the time. It's amazing. Uh, let's see, I think, have, oh, Allison. I mean, Allison gave us uh, her latest update. It's, it's her baby boy, but do you want to talk at all about your, your life since Quidditch? Yeah, I, I retired from playing after the Olympics. I felt like there you couldn't get any higher after that. So I left <laughs> the playing field and then I stopped um volunteering after 2014 and I think the last time I've ever even seen anything Quidditch was Alex when you and Dan came to stay with me in Texas and we went to um League City to to watch a tournament so that was my last Quidditch experience oh yeah the Major League and, Quidditch uh, Cup that was awesome mm -hmm. Major League Quidditch we Championships ate, we ate delicious yeah. quail that Allison's husband <laughs> shot that day yep yeah. so I uh I moved to Texas I've been in the energy industry for the last 10 years um, I actually, uh, I'm on maternity leave right now, obviously, uh, because my son was born, but I just uh, accepted a position at an LA-based renewable energy company. I'm going to be the senior director of um, st uh, sales strategy and emerging channels. So I've been in middle management corporate America for the past decade doing products and strategic development and business development um, and business acquisitions and all of that sort of boring sounding corporate stuff <laughs> and Alex you have to go too because I know you've had some exciting news recently uh, okay fine um I just got engaged uh to my girlfriend now fiance Lisa Schwartz um she's an emergency room doctor out here in California um in terms of my life outside of that uh my first role outside of Quidditch was with Sky Zone, a trampoline park, and I was hired to run uh, their trampoline dodgeball championships, which were on ESPN and Fox Sports, and were it was probably like the second goofiest sport you could go to after Quidditch. Um, and and has that's evolved a little bit because our company got acquired by a brand called Circus Tricks, which owns a ton of different trampoline parks, and I now. Um, head up the innovation team. So we come up with like new attractions for our parks, like giant slides and crazy obstacle courses and things like that. It's a fun job. 
Um, so this is sort of like the moment in professional wrestling when you think the match is over and, and like the defending champion comes storming in and that's Alicia Radford who just joined us late. I don't know if you want to say anything, Alicia, about World Cup four, what it was like being there or want to share anything about your life or just uh, just go for it off the top of your head. But if, if you want to say anything, I'm sure we'd love, we'd all love to hear from you. Well, thanks. Hi, everybody. I don't have video right now. Sorry about that. Um, I think I think World Cup four was probably only the second time I saw you in person, Alex. <laughs> I started a team at the University of Washington in Seattle, and we went to the 2008 World Cup, which was the second one at Middlebury. And that was a very formative college experience for me. Um, and then I started organizing on the West Coast with Alex because there were almost no Quidditch teams there then, um, and then became a founding board member. But I remember I flew to New York, I think on like Monday or something before World Cup four. And it was the biggest race against the clock that I think I experienced even, even considering all the like World Cups and Nationals that I helped plan after that. <laughs> I think we were getting like, I don't know, two or three hours of sleep a night every single day leading up. There's just so, so many things to coordinate and things to do. And Alex's apartment was just like full of t-shirts and bags and boxes and just everything. And we had, we had a lot of volunteers coming in and helping. Um, and yeah, World Cup Four, I think still is probably the most impactful Quidditch experience I've had. I was just about to graduate college and at that tournament, I decided that I would move to New York after graduation so that we could you know, try to keep building the league and the sport. Um, and so it's been really, really fun seeing all your faces and hearing from, from you all. I um, stayed with USQ until the end of 2015. Um, and since then I've become an accountant. Um, so I work for a small firm in Seattle. We do bookkeeping and accounting for mostly nonprofits. Um, so I get to work with a lot of different folks around the city. Um, well, in normal times now, I just work with a lot of folks over Zoom in my apartment, <laughs> like everyone else. But yeah, I certainly have no idea where my career or life would have gone without Quidditch because it, uh, it's just been the biggest, the biggest thing that's, that's happened to me. I think that's a really good way of putting it, Alicia. I think that's a great way of putting it, Alicia. Thank you. And I'm glad you're able to join us. Um, yeah, Alicia did a lot of the accounting for, uh, for our Quidditch organization. It was like really instrumental in a lot of the like nitty gritty behind the scenes work of like, not just helping Quidditch run, but converting it into a sustainable operation. Um, so really grateful to Alicia. And I want to close out with a really funny story, um, cause we're, we're about at, at time here. Um, but the day after the event was over. Um, before the event, we had no idea how many people were going to show up. We were hoping it was going to be a lot. There were no tickets sold. We bought a of merchandise. I think we, we spent like, we had to buy like 15,000 or $20,000 worth of merchandise on credit cards before the event, just risking it all. You know, God forbid it was bad weather and no one showed up. We would have been screwed, but it was a beautiful weekend. There were a ton of audience members there. So we like sold out our merchandise. And which was important because we had to sell that to pay for the event. And so we, Alicia and I had to take all the cash to the bank the next day. And there was like $30,000 of like random crinkly bills. And we first, we, we, we put it into a garbage bag and a shopping cart and just pushed it to the bank. And, and no one would suspect that like a wrinkly old garbage bag and a shopping cart would have that much money. And we show up to the bank and we have to go up to the window and He's like, what are you here for? And we're like, we have to deposit some cash. She's like, okay, we'll just put it through. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, we can't just slide this through the window. She's like, how much? And there's like a lot of people behind me. So I have to like whisper, it's like $30,000. And she just like looks at me and she's like, okay. And like calls over a manager and they take us to the back. And, and you have to think how sketchy this looks. And then two, like 22 year olds showing up to the bank with a garbage bag full of like $30,000 in cash. Uh, and I, you know, I'm just grateful that that event worked out and we were able to pay everything off. And it, and it also gave us like a little bit of operating 
uh, money for the future to keep the league moving forwards. Um, that's just such a funny memory when I think back to that day and these poor bankers probably thought we were definitely drug dealers, but somehow they took the cash anyway. Um, but funny times. Um, so we're over time now, so we're, we're going to wrap this up. If you guys have any uh, any questions, like feel free to go to the USQ website. Um, there's email addresses there. Uh, you can always reach out to Mary. You can find me on Facebook. I think everyone, most people here attending, I'm already friends with on Facebook, or you can find me if you're not, I'm happy to talk. And I'm sure anyone here, you can look them up too and ask them questions about the old days. Um, a big thank you to all our panelists for joining. Um, I know, uh, it, you know, I really appreciate your time and, and coming out here and, and talking about your past experiences. It's been a wild ride. And uh, I, I think it's just great to watch Quidditch keep growing. And I think the sport still has such a bright future ahead of, us, ahead of it. So uh, thank you all and uh, have a great night. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, thank Alex. you, Mary. Bye, guys. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Good everyone. To see you. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, if you liked this program, check out the other USQ Plus programs on our website, usquidditch.org. We're gonna be doing several throughout the rest of the season, um, as well as some hopefully to close out the rest of the year, like on um, uh, winter fantasy tournament um, rules, different um, aspects of the game that are becoming more and more important with all the rule changes. So. Um, be sure to check us out on there and follow us, us follow, follow us on social media to get all the updates because there might not be in-person Quidditch, but there's still a lot of fun, interesting things going on right now as we work to refocus in this time of great transition and change as we all deal with the effects of the pandemic. So thank you all so much for joining us. It was really wonderful to see everyone and have a great night.